Leaving Time by Jodi Piku, part one. How to explain my heroic courtesy. I feel that my body was inflated by a mischievous boy. Once I was the size of a falcon, the size of a lion, once I was not the elephant I find I am. My pelt sags and my master scolds me for a botch trick. I practiced it all night in my tent, so I was somewhat sleepy. People connect me with sadness and often rationality. Randall Gerald compared me to Wallace Stevens, the American poet. I can see it in the lumbering terrace. But in my mind, I am more like Elliot, the man of Europe, a man of cultivation. Anyone so ceremonious suffers breakdowns. I do not like the spectacular elements with balance, the high wire act and cones. The elephants are images of humility as we undertake our melancholy migrations to die. Did you know though that elephants were taught to write the Greek alphabet with their hooves? Worn out by suffering, we lie on our great backs, tossing up grass at the heaven. It's a distraction, not a prayer. That's not humility you see on our long failed final journeys. It's procrastination. It hurts my heavy body to lie down. Dan Chasen, the elephant. Jenna, when it comes to memory, I'm kind of a pro. I may only be 13, but I've studied it the way other kids my age devour fashion magazines. There's a kind of memory you have about the world like knowing that stoves are hot and that if you don't wear shoes outside in the winter, you'll get frostbite. There's the kind you get from your senses that staring at the sun makes you squint and that worms aren't the best choice of meal. There are dates you can recall from history, history class and spew back on your final exam because they matter, or so I'm told, in the grand scheme of things. And there are the personal details you remember, like the high spikes on your graph of your own life, which matter to nobody but yourself. Last year at school, my science teacher let me do a whole independent study on memory. Most of my teachers let me do independent studies because they know I get bored in class and frankly, I think they're a little scared that I know more than they do and they don't want to have to admit it. My first memory is white at the edges like a photo taken with too bright a flash. My mother is holding spun sugar on a cone, cotton candy. She raises her fingers to her lips. This is our secret and then tears off a tiny piece. When she touches it to my lips, the sugar dissolves. My tongue curls around her fingers and sucks hard. It's city, she tells me, sweet. This is not my bottle, it's not a taste I know, but it's a good one. And then she leans down and kisses my forehead. It's sweetie, she says, sweetheart. I can't be more than nine months old. This is pretty amazing, really, because most kids trace their first memories to somewhere between the ages of two and five. That doesn't mean that babies are little amnesiacs, they have memories long before they have language, but weirdly we can't access them once we start talking. Maybe the reason I remember the cotton candy episode is because my mother was speaking Hosha, which isn't her language, but one she picked up when she was working on her doctorate in South Africa. Or maybe the reason I have this random memory is a trade-off my brain made because I can't remember what I desperately wish I could. Details of the night my mother disappeared. My mother was a scientist and for a span of time, she even studied memory. It was part of her work on post-traumatic stress and elephants. You know that old adage that elephants never forget? Well, it's fact. I could tell you all of my mother's data. If you want proof, I've practiced it. I've got it memorized, no pun intended. Her official published findings were that memory is linked to strong emotion and that negative moments are like scribbling with permanent marker on the wall of the brain. But there's one fine line between a negative moment and a traumatic one. Negative moments get remembered, traumatic ones get forgotten or warped so they're unrecognizable or else they turn into a big blank white nothing. I get in my head when I try to focus on that night. Here's what I know. I was three. My mother was found on the sanctuary property unconscious about a mile south of the dead body. This is what the police reports. She was taken to the hospital. I'm not mentioned in the police reports. Afterward, my grandmother took me to stay at her place because my father was frantically dealing with a dead elephant caregiver and a wife who had been knocked out cold. Sometime before dawn, my mother regained consciousness and vanished from the hospital without any staff seeing her go. I never saw her again. Sometimes I think my life was two train cars hitched together at the moment of my mom's disappearance. But when I try to see how they connect, there's a jarring on the track that jerks my head back around. I know that I used to be a girl whose hair was strawberry blonde who ran around like a wild thing while my mother took endless notes about elephants. Now I'm a kid who is too serious for her age and too smart for her own good. And yet, as impressive as I am, the scientific statistics, I fail miserably when it comes to real life facts, like knowing that Wanala was a website and not a new hot brand. Uh, in eighth grade, 
is a microcosm of the social hierarchy of the human adolescent, and to my mother it certainly would have been. Then recruiting 50 named elephant herds in the Thule block of Botswana cannot compete with identifying all the members of One Direction. It's not like I don't fit in school because I'm the only kid without a mother. There are lots of kids with missing parents or kids who don't talk about their parents or kids whose parents are now living with new spouses and new kids. Still, I don't really have friends at school. I sit at the lunch table on the far end eating whatever my grandmother's packed me. While the cool girls, who I swear to God call themselves the icicles, chatter about how they are going to grow up and work for OPI and make nail polish colors based off names of famous movies. Magnet Lemon prefer blondes. A few should good men. Maybe I've tried to join the conversation once or twice, but when I do, they usually look at me as if they've smelled something bad coming from my direction. Their little button nose is wrinkled, and then I go back to whatever they were talking about. I can't say I'm devastated by the way I'm ignored. I guess I have more important things on my mind. The memories on the other side of my mother's disappearance are just spotty. I can tell you about my new bedroom at my grandmother's place, which had a big girl bed at first. There was a little woven basket on the nightstand, which was inexplicably filled with pink packets of sweet and low, although there was no coffee maker around. Every night, even before I could count, I'd peek inside to make sure they were still there. I still do. I can tell you about visiting my father at the beginning. The halls at Hartwick House smelled like ammonia and pee, and even when my grandmother urged me to talk to him, I climbed up on the bed, shivering at the thought of being so close to someone I recognized and didn't know at all. He didn't speak or move. I can describe how tears leaked out of his eyes as if it were a natural and unexpected pheno natural and expected phenomenon, the way the cold can of soda sweats on a summer day. I remember the nightmares I had, which weren't really nightmares, but just me being awakened from a dead sleep by Maura's loud trumpeting. Even after my grandma came running into my room and explained to me that the matriarch elephant lived hundreds of miles away now, in a new sanctuary in Tennessee, I had this nagging sense that Maura was trying to tell me something, and that if I only spoke her language as well as my mother had, I'd understand. All I have left my mother is her research. I pore over her journals because I knew one day the words will rearrange themselves on the page and point me toward her. She taught me even in absentia that all good science starts with a hypothesis, which is just a hunch dressed up in fancy vocabulary. And my hunch is this, she would never have left me behind, not willingly. It's the least, it's the last thing I do, I'm going to prove it. When I wake up, Gertie is draped over my feet, a giant dog, dog rug. She twitches, running after something she can only see in her dreams. I know what that feels like. I try to get out of bed without waking her, but she jumps up and barks at the closed door of my bedroom. Relax, I say, sinking my fingers into the thick fur of the ruff at her neck. She licks my cheeks, but doesn't relax at all. She keeps her eyes fixed on the bedroom door as if she can see what the other side, which given what I planned for the day is pretty ironic. Gertie leaps off the bed, her wagging tail pounding the wall. I open the door and let her scamper downstairs where my grandma will let her out and feed her and start to cook breakfast for me. Gertie came to my grandmother's house after a year I did. Before that, she had lived at the sanctuary and she was best friends with an elephant named Syra. She spent every day at Cyrus's side, and when Gertie got sick, Cyrus even stood guard over her, gently rubbing her with her trunk. It was not the first story of a dog and elephant bonding, but it was a legendary one, written up in children's books and featured on the news. A famous photogra photographer even shot a calendar of unlikely animal friendships and made Gertie miss July. So when Cyrus was sent away to, after the sanctuary closed, Gertie was just as abandoned as I. For months, no one knew what happened to her. And then one day when my grandmother answered the doorbell when there was an animal rescue, of rescue officer asking if we knew this dog, which had been found in our neighborhood, she still had her collar with her name embroidered on, embroidered on it. Gertie was skinny and flea-bitten, but she started licking my face. My grandmother let Gertie stay, probably because she thought it would help me adjust. If we were going to be honest, I have to tell you it didn't work. I've always been a loner and I've never really felt like I belong here. I'm like one of those women who read Jane Austen obsessively and still hope that Mr. Darcy might show up at the door. Or the Civil War reenactors who growl at each other on battlefields now spotted with baseball fields and park benches. I'm the princess in an ivory tower. Except every brick is made of history and I built myself a prison. I did have one friend at school once who sort of understood. Chatham Clark was the only person I ever told about my mother and how I was going to find her. 
Chatham lived with her aunt because her mother was a drug addict and in jail, and she had never met her father. It's noble, Chatham told me, how much you want to see your mother. When I asked her what that meant, she told me how once her aunt had taken her to a prison to see her mom, who was serving her term, how she dressed up in a frilly skirt and those shoes that made look like black mirrors. But her mother was gray and lifeless, her eyes dead, and her teeth rotted out from her mouth. And Chatham said that even though her mother said she wished she could give her a hug, she had never been so happy for something that, for all she was, she had never been so happy for something as she was for that wall of plastic between them and the visiting booth. She had never gone back again. Chatham was useful in a lot of ways. She took me to buy my first bra because my grandmother hadn't thought to cover up a non-existent bosom. And as Chatham said, no one at the age of 10 who was to change in a school locker room should let the girls go free. She passed me notes in English class, crude stick figure drawings of our teacher, who used too much self-tanner and smelled like cats. She linked arms with me as we walked down the hall, and every wildlife researcher will tell you that when it comes to survival, even in a hostile environment, a pack of two is infinitely safer than a pack of one. When morning Chatham stopped coming to school, when I called her house, no one answered. I begged over there to find a for sale sign. I didn't believe that she'd leave without saying any word, especially since she knew that was what had freaked me out so much about my mom's disappearance. But it got harder and harder to defend her to myself as a week went by and then two. When I started skipping homework assignments and failing tests, which wasn't my style at all, I was summoned to the school counselor's office. Miss Sugarman was, was a thousand years old and had puppets in her office, so the kids who were too traumatized to say the word vagina could, I guess, put on a punch in Judy's show about where they'd been inappropriately touched. Anyway, I didn't think Miss Sugarman could guide me out of my paper bag, much less a broken friendship. When she asked me what I thought had happened to Chatham, I assumed that she had been I had assumed she had been raptured, that I was left behind. Wouldn't be the first time. Miss Sugarman didn't call me back to her office, and if it was considered the oddball in school before, I was completely off the charts weird now. My grandmother was puzzled by Chatham's visit vanishing act. Without telling you, she said at dinner. That's not how you treat a friend. I didn't know how to explain to her that the whole time Chatham was my partner in crime. I was anticipating this. When someone leaves you, once you expect it to happen again. Eventually, if you stop getting close enough to people to let them become important to you, because then you don't notice when they drop out of the world. I know that sounds incredibly depressing for a 13-year-old, but it beats being forced to accept that the common denominator must be you. I may not be able to change my future, but I'm sure as hell going to try to figure out my past. So I have a morning ritual. Some people have coffee and read the paper. Some people check Facebook. Others straight iron their hair or do a hundred sit-ups. Me, I put on my clothes and then I go to my computer. I spend a lot of time on the internet, mostly at www.namus.gov, the official Department of Justice website for missing and unidentified persons. I check the unidentified persons database quickly to make sure that no medical examiners have entered new information about a deceased woman, Jane Doe. Then I check the unclaimed persons database, running through any additions to the list of people who have died but have no next of kin. Finally, I log into the missing persons database and go right to my mom's entry. Status missing, first name Alice, middle name Kingston, last name Metcalf, nickname alias Nun. Last date LKA July 16, 2004, 11.45 p.m. Age LKA 36, age now 46. Race, white, sex, female, height, 65 inches. Weight, 125. City, Boone, state, NH. Circumstances, Alice Metcalf was a naturalist and researcher at the New England Elephant Sanctuary. She was found unconscious the evening of July 16, 2004, at approximately 10 p.m., one mile south of the body of a female sanctuary employee who had been trampled by an elephant. After, <clears throat> after being admitted to Mercy Hospital, in Boone Heights, <clears throat> NH, Alice regained consciousness at approximately 11 p.m. She was last seen by a nurse checking her vitals at 11.45 p.m. Nothing's changed on the profile. I know because I am the one who wrote it. There's another page about my mother's hair color red and eye color green, about whether she had any scars or deformities or tattoos or official, artificial limbs that could be identified. There's a page that lists the clothing she was wearing when she disappeared, but I had to leave that blank because I don't know. There's an empty page about possible transportation methods, about another about dental records, and one for her DNA sample. 
There's a picture of her too that I scanned from the only photo in the house my grandma hasn't squirreled away in the attic. A close-up of my mother holding me in her arms in front of the mora, the elephant. Then there's a page that police contacts. One of them, Donnie Boylan, retired and moved to Florida has, and has Alzheimer's. You'd be amazed at what you can learn on Google. The other, Virgil Stanhope, was the last listed as a police newsletter for being promoted to detective at a ceremony on October 13, 2004. I know from my digital sleuthing that he no longer employed at the Boone Police Department. Aside from that, it appears he has disappeared off the face of the earth. It's not as uncommon as you think. There are entire families whose homes were abandoned with television sets blaring, kettles boiling, toys strewn across the floor, families whose vans were found in empty parking lots or sunk in local ponds, and yet no bodies were ever located. There are college girls who went missing after they wrote their numbers down on napkins for men at bars. There are grandfathers who wandered into the woods and they were never heard from again. There are babies who were kissed goodnight in their cribs and gone before the morning light of morning. There are mothers who wrote out grocery lists, got in their cars, but never came home from the stop and shop.